as the title says, and as the, uh, um, as the talk has noted on the, the promotional information for the conference, I am gonna be talking about disassembling compiled GWT sources. And these words, unfortunately, are a little bit loose, uh, and we do touch on that very briefly here, um, but I think a much saner way of describing this whole topic is we're ungwitting JavaScript, trying to ungwit as much of it as we can. Um, because, I mean, people talk about JavaScript as sort of the assembly of the web, and we talk about the JavaScript compiler, well, as compiling, um, but I think other people have described it in other terms that might be helpful as all. It's, it's, it's as well, it's uh, transpiling, it's changing from one language to another. Um, and, and just to touch on the, the FUD point right here up front, um, have we all at least had some quick summary about how security should work in the browser and cross-origin requests and XSSs are bad and never, ever, ever, ever trust the client about anything, do everything on the server? Does everyone, that sound familiar to at least a few people in the room? Okay, great, great. Um, because when the first iPhone came out, it took, what, a week before a machine sealed in with assembly code into there was cracked, and I think the second one was just a matter of hours after it was released. JavaScript, by comparison, is, is an extremely high-level language. There's lots of fun information there for you to dig through and find things. And as far as I know, this is the first real attempt at trying to uh, extract some of the details, at least in a public setting like a conference like this. I've seen work in the past about trying to take about RPC and trying to find the RPC interfaces, uh, but most of that code is either disappearing or defunct. Um, and for what it's worth, I didn't actually target that area. So just with that reminder that client code, by the way, is code you gave the client, and the client therefore can manipulate, they can run it on their own, uh, they can try and change it, they've got Firebug, Chrome Inspector, whatever it is, to try and modify how those things are working. They can replay requests. So before we even get into any of this, this should already be clear, we don't have our security in the compiled output. Okay. With that in mind, to hopefully less muddy the waters here about what our focus is, I'm here to try and ungwit JavaScript. And the first step is to understand what exactly GWT is doing when we compile the jo from Java to JavaScript. And I'm going to summarize most of Roberto's slides in about you know three minutes, try to get through it as quickly as possible, and then take a look at the, the JavaScript structures that clearly indicate what kinds of things are going on in Java. And then we're gonna see if we can automate this process, what kinds of things we can do to make it more repeatable, uh, quick as possible, and then have a little fun along the way. So, without further introduction, we've got a compiler, right? We're gonna call it a compiler for the sake of this talk and for other talks. And our purpose is to turn Java into JavaScript. That's pretty much all what we're here for. And along the way, the compiler optimizes Java, then it generates some JavaScript, and then it optimizes JavaScript. Did anybody go to Roberto's talk or any other talk about uh, the compiler in the past? Has anybody seen roughly how that might work? Okay, so a few people. Okay, a bunch of people, great. So before looking at that too much, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack than what that talk took and talk about similarities first between Java and JavaScript. Um, we've got a pretty much similar expression in statement syntax. We more or less need semicolons to end a statement. Um, expressions yield some value which we can assign to something or we can use in an if. We've got the same sorts of keywords, new, if, for, while. We both have numeric value types. Uh, we both have numerics, or sorry, uh, immutable strings. And everything else is pretty much an object or it can be null. Um, and then we sort of get into the differences, which is of course what the compiler has to do, what all the various normalization steps are for. How do we move from Java to JavaScript? And of course, the, the first one people start off when they look at the Java side of the equation is the verbosity of the language. You've got to say a lot more to do the same kind of thing. And then of course, the other side of the room says, well, on the other hand, we've got your blood pressure, trying to keep that down by not worrying about all the various uh, uh, oddities of the language and the runtime that we have to live in. But I'm gonna try not to make too much fun of JavaScript during this talk. Um, I know that can be difficult, but I'm gonna ask you to try to restrain yourselves as well. So again, going with the differences, taking it slightly more seriously, uh, we've got our Java dot equals and equal equal, and then in JavaScript, of course, we've got equal equal and equal equal equal. Um, and then, of course, you have to contend with the whole false and null and undefined, and then it turns into this giant mess of, okay, exactly what exactly is equal to what? But again, we're not gonna try to dig into that. We're starting from the Java perspective, where equal and dot equals are relatively uh, consistent, we can use them in a, in a pretty predictable way, 
and the compiler will deal with all this mess for us, so we don't have to deal with it. So when we look at um, the kind of code we write, we've got no methods, we just have functions in JavaScript, which is not entirely true. We do have the ability to declare something that looks a lot like methods. We can build objects that happen to have functions attached to them, which we can then refer to as methods. Um, and this sort of fits into the whole class versus prototype idea. In Java, you define a class, you define it up front before anything starts running, reflection and Java Syst notwithstanding. Um, and then once you've got that class, you basically interact with those instances and they are, they're concrete, they're defined, and that's the end of that. But in JavaScript, which we may or may not be aware, we're not really class-oriented, we're not really uh, quite as object-oriented in the same way. We've got prototypes. You make an object, and then that object can act as a sort of uh, template for the next object, a prototype for the next object, and you can construct it. You can make a constructor, you can attach a prototype to it, and every time you call it, you get another copy of that object. And using this basic pattern, we can make a superclass, and then we can subclass it by making another instance of that, attaching it to another constructor, and again, using that as a sort of cookie cutter to keep on producing more objects. Um, constructors really then just become functions that happen to call new and are able to use this, the keyword this, to mean something in particular. Uh, and I think that's very nearly the same slide, sorry for that. And then we get instance of. So in Java we use instance of to say, does this thing match this other thing here? Can I cast to that? Will I be able to call methods that exist on that? Whereas in JavaScript we have the instance of operator, which essentially just means, do you, does this object use that constructor? It says nothing about what prototype methods are available, it just says, does it use that same constructor? Which for us Java folk, when we've got two constructors in a class, and then you've got a subclass, which again has two constructors, and each one calls a different one, you're not allowed to ask questions like, does an instance of this implement this? Or does it, uh, is it an instance of this constructor over here? They don't match, JavaScript will tell us no. So these are other things we've got to manufacture along the way in order to uh, build up our Java code into JavaScript. We've also got some other fun things like class loaders. Anybody ever had a headache that was class loader induced? Ever? Few people here and there have had something like that. Well, we don't actually have a class loader per se in JavaScript. We don't have a lot of these concepts of nesting them, of figuring out, okay, which one are you allowed to load things from? But we do have to still have the class semantics of exactly what does it mean to load a class to reference it for the first time. Now in JavaScript, when you add a JavaScript file, it's run. It's run start to finish, and that's sort of the end of that. And you can build pieces in it to say, well, I don't actually want to set this up just yet, but that means in order to make something that should not run immediately, you have to wrap it up in a function. And if you've ever got, say, three or more JavaScript files, and they've got some kind of circular dependency between them to say, okay, which one do I start first? How do I boot them all up? Either you can just, either you can just um, list them in the correct order, and expect it to work indefinitely, or very diligently go through and reorder the files to make sure they behave correctly, or you effectively have to construct these sort of class loading mechanisms that we take for granted in JavaScript to say, well, once I reference this object, then go ahead and uh, start up this other one, then go ahead and start up this other one. But again, in Java, we sort of take it for granted that we can do things like this, where we've got two classes, and if we reference A first, for example, then A is going to first run its class class initializer, uh, and we'll log a.cl in it, and then once we, and then it will try and run the do it method. And if we were to make a new instance of b, well, we've already run the class initializer for a, we won't run it again, and then we'll go ahead and run the b class initializer, and then do a.do it. But if we ran the other way around, of course, and we just said b, we made a new instance of b, first thing we'd run is this class initializer, then we'd jump up, have to run the A class, class initializer before we could run the A methods, and then we could run the A methods. So by and large, even in Java, we try to stay away from these dependencies between classes, uh, especially where you get anything to be circular and saying, okay, this depends on this, depends on the thing that just ran, because you can get into some trouble that way. But as Java developers who have built large applications, by and large, we're accustomed to this. We're expecting things like this. Okay, so we've got the languages worked out vague ideas about what's happening on both sides of the line here. And we want to worry about the compiler and what the compiler does. 
And very briefly, it optimizes code. We've got some very simple optimizations that seem at first blush to be you know, simple to implement that wouldn't take much work at all. We've got a pruner. And right as the name suggests, it prunes things we don't use. It prunes unreferenced types, methods, uh, variables, and then dead code eliminator, which sounds like it could do the same thing, but actually works a little bit differently. Instead of uh, going after things that seem not to be referenced, uh, it goes after a code that the compiler can prove can't run or simplifies things that it can run into just a single simple expression rather than a more complicated one. And then we've got one which static staticifies methods. And what I mean by that is we take a method that already exists and try to make it static. And Roberto demonstrated this earlier, that we take uh, the this that might exist inside that function or that method and try to make it the first argument of that. Um, this ends up being simpler to call. We don't need to say, okay, for this object, let's look up a method somewhere in its type hierarchy that has this name. And we don't ever need to reference this. Now in Java, you can just say this dot something, or you can just say something, and it will always refer to that object right away. But in JavaScript, this is not, uh, or this must always be explicit. You must always spell it out. And because it's not a word that we can obfuscate, that always ends up being one, two, three, four bytes plus a dot to reference it instead of possibly just one byte. So we save a little bit of space by going through and staticifying as much as possible. Um, and then finally, if we were to try and override a method in a class, we might sometimes want to call the superclasses method. But because we overwrote it, the, the superclasses method no longer exists in JavaScript's prototype chain. So in order to call super methods, we can't say something simple like super dot do this method. We have to actually go find a reference to the object or the, the class type, and then its prototype, and then call the method, but we have to apply it to the this we want to run it on with the right arguments. So by staticifying superclass methods, we're able just to say, nope, it's already a static method. I can just invoke it on this with some other arguments. Makes it much simpler to call from other places. So very briefly, what this might look like, if we've got a method which can be overridden called generate name, which takes some parameter, and then from our IDE's handy uh, highlighting, we've got some field and then some uh, method defined in the class. We know that those things are gonna have to end up getting rewritten to include this, or the compiler can say, no, I need this method to be polymorphic, so we're gonna keep the method uh, in a way that we can call it instance.generate name. But then when we actually call it, we're gonna dispatch to the staticified version. We're gonna call the staticified version with this as the first argument. And now we've got the this object, so we can say this.base name and this.set name. And we've got one more argument that gets passed in, this. If this isn't used in anywhere inside of there, then the compiler can go ahead and remove it because you may as well just have a static method to begin with. And when the compiler goes ahead and obfuscates, we can take this and reduce it to one or two letters, very simply here. Okay, what other optimizations do we have? We can type tighten and we can method call tighten. And very simply what we're looking at here is if you say I've got a list of type string called strings and it's going to be an instance of an array list. And then you go ahead later on and say okay, I wanna add something to that string or to that list. The compiler notices that you only ever assign that variable to one type and says okay, let's go ahead and say instead of list on one side and array list on the other side, we'll write them both as array list. And then now we know exactly which add implementation we should call, which allows us then to go do other fun things like staticifying methods without ever doing the polymorphic dispatch. Uh, method call tightener is the second half of that where we say, well, now that I know which version of this it is, and I know that there's no subclass which will override this, let's just define exactly which method we wanna call instead. So that instead of calling object.generate name, we can instead call dollar sign generate name on object. And then a few that I was reminded of this morning that I left out of my original slides, so sorry guys in US, uh, I didn't catch these. Uh, there's a few other things we have to normalize, uh, like catch block optimization, or sorry, catch block uh, structure. In Java, you're allowed to catch one type or another type or a third type, for example. Whereas in JavaScript, you just get the ability to catch. And whatever it is, you have to handle it because there's no way of saying the exception is of this type. In JavaScript, technically, you can throw strings and numbers, which aren't exceptions. But in JavaScript, or sorry, Java, we're a little more uh, limited, I guess, in that regard. Um, and then, of course, how to implement casts and how to implement instance of, how to implement type checks.
Okay, so that's all I'm planning on saying about the compiler itself, except to say, okay, how do we wind up backward? And how do we look at the compiled JavaScript and recognize what kinds of patterns we're seeing? So before we dig into these pieces here, anybody ever opened up a compiled JavaScript file? Typically, you see some junk at the top, dollar sign, GWT, version, meth, uh, module name, and then we see what looks to be the same thing over and over and over again. What does that look like? Anybody opened up, looked at the first 50 lines of a file? Nobody. Oh, that's too bad. All right, you guys might be in the wrong talk. Hmm? It's just a function. It's a function with a simple name, and then a couple parentheses and a couple of curly braces. And then another function with a different name, and a couple of parentheses and a couple of curly, curly braces. And all we have is just the, all these empty functions over and over and over again. But apparently these empty functions get called because we're led to understand the compiler is pretty smart and would remove things it doesn't use. So we've got that at the top, we've got the bootstrap. How exactly do you set up all this stuff? It's from the linker itself, and that's all I'm gonna say about the linker, I'm afraid. Um, and then we've got all these methods, and they happen to be ordered that way at the top of a file for a particular reason, but it does stick out like a sore thumb to some of us, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But we've got these static functions, basically. They're named functions. They are global, so that anything can call them without ever referencing this. And then eventually, much, much later in the file, if you've managed to scroll down to fairly near the end, we see some objects set up where we say, I'm going to build a class, here's the ID of the class, here's the constructors the class has, and then afterward we'll declare a bunch of methods that will attach to that class, so we can call object dot do this. So back to those static functions for a moment. They all sort of look like this. They have, they say function, they have a name of some kind, they may or may not have parameters, they may or may not have a body. And these can fit a bunch of different purposes for us as Java developers. And the first big one is a constructor. So remember all those empty functions we've got? Has anybody ever written a Java class where you didn't declare a constructor? Okay, okay, so at least a few people. Has anybody ever written a Java class where you did write a constructor, but it subclassed a class that didn't have a constructor? So any case like this whatsoever is where we're gonna be seeing these empty functions showing up. We have to have, in JavaScript, you have to expressly declare a constructor you plan on calling. Because there's no idea of a type, it's just a constructor which happens to have a prototype squished into it. So we've gotta build all these constructors so that we can call them later on. So that's the first kind of static function we've got, a constructor. And these may look like this with no arguments and no body. They may have some arguments, they may have some body. It just depends on exactly how you plan on using these things. And then we've got static methods, which seems to be, you know, pretty confined set because I'm betting not a lot of us write a lot of static methods in our code, hopefully. Um, but we also have in this category staticified instance methods, like that code we looked at earlier where it used to be an instance method, but the compiler was able to say, well, I can save a few bytes here and there, or I can make it faster if I make this method into something static and include this as the first argument. And then you've also got class initializers. We touched on those very briefly earlier, that this is how we actually get the class going. And we've also got instance initializers. And instance initializers sort of play uh, hand in hand with uh, all the fields you've got where you give them a value but you didn't actually uh, do that from inside of the constructor where you just inline declared a value. We're not gonna talk about that too much, but it's an important part of the process that uh, GWT has to pay careful attention to in order to correctly reflect Java semantics in our JavaScript. And then the main piece we're missing here in terms of functions that we've got is instance methods. We've got some prototype, and then we name the method that we're going to call, and then we say, okay, here's the function that'll go ahead and do the work. And we give it a name again, we give the method two names. The basic reasoning here is, when we have the prototype, when we have the object we're calling the method on, we might want a dot two string, and then a subclass will have another two string. So the first name, the method part of this slide, is going to be uh, the same at every level. That way you can say, I wanna call two string, and whatever level of the type hierarchy will figure out what method I wanted to call. But the second part, the name of the function, we're not using anonymous, uh, sorry, anonymous functions, because when we build up our stack trace later on, when an exception happens, unless some of you guys read exception-free code, um, I haven't managed so far, but still trying, 
um, that name is what will end up in the stack trace because there's no way for the, compi or for the JavaScript runtime to be certain that there, it was only ever attached as one uh, prototype method that could be called from nowhere else. So for example, we've got in this slide here, we've got a set name function which just calls this dot set name. Now chances are in most cases this would be inlined and the compiler would get rid of it. I managed to cheat to make sure this would stay here by overriding set name in other places so the compiler had to always leave it there so it was always called in exactly the same way. Anybody at least written a few instance methods before? Okay, so we're all familiar with Java. We've all used it a little bit before. So this is the other half here where we want to have, um, oops, I'm sorry, I lied. This is not that. This is one, uh, this is two special forms of that uh, instance method. We've got one where we go ahead and return some static method, and we've got one where we don't call return, but we just call some static method. So what's the return type of a JavaScript function that doesn't call return? Well, in Java land, we don't have undefined, thankfully. So we just have void. We don't have a return type. JavaScript, there's no concept of this. If you end up returning this, yes, you're absolutely right. You'll get an undefined object, or you'll get a reference to undefined, a reference that is undefined. And these end up being helpful because in a lot of cases, when we see something that matches this pattern, the compiler has said, well, I need to call this method statically from somewhere. So I'm going to go ahead and put the static method over here, and then I'll call it from here, because in at least one place, I need to call it uh, polymorphically, like this. Uh, and sorry, two string is, is one great example of this. We see this a lot where, where you end up calling, hey, I've got some object, let me two string it. It's great for your logs, for example. You end up two stringing a lot of things all over the place, so we need to keep it polymorphic. But every once in a while, you know you have a person object you're calling two string on. Constructor calls. These come in two forms in JavaScript, with parentheses and without. It turns out you don't actually need parentheses in order to call a constructor. It still invokes the method as normally, it just doesn't pass in any arguments. So we have to watch out for both patterns as we're trying to figure out what calls what. And then a simple variation of this, remember I said JavaScript can technically throw anything and catch anything, but we want to see what happens when we construct uh, an exception. And this is just a very simple way of saying, hey, if you're throwing some new object, that's probably an exception. Um, I've never actually tried in Java, or JavaScript for that matter, to throw a number, um, and I really can't imagine what good it would do. But we can be pretty guaranteed that our JavaScript code, if we ever see something that looks like throw, new, and then some term, it's going to be a constructor for an exception type. So it gives us a little bit more information as we're taking apart the application, what kinds of uh, objects we're finding, where in the type hier hierarchy that object happens to fit. So the next piece we've got is how do we call these? And some of them are pretty predictable. If you have a named thing that has parentheses, you're calling a method. If you're calling uh, something like this, instance.method, you're calling a polymorphic method, and you're expecting the compiler to have to work, or sorry, not the compiler, the runtime to have to work out which version of the method do I end up needing to call. And then we move on to how exactly do we build classes. So this is java.lang.object for a very simple application, just a few pieces built for us. And um, we end up having, first of all, a defined class which has one, which is the first object type, null, because object doesn't have any superclass, curly braces, which we'll get into later exactly what that means, and then we list the constructor. Object has only one constructor, you call it with no arguments, and then these are all the various methods we'll be attaching to object. We'll need a get class, so we can call it later on, we'll need a hash code, and a two string. And for some reason we have two, two strings, and I never did figure out why that was, but it's on the slide anyway, so I can ask one of you guys later. Um, and basically, when we're in obfuscated code, this follows the form at the top. We're going to create some type, and it's either going to have a new type ID, and then a super type ID, or a null, or a different object if we're using JS interop. Then we've got this castable type map, which I'm not going to tell you about right now. And then all the various constructors which we end up using uh, in order to uh, create this particular object. Okay. So at that point, we've got all the basic primitives which we're going to start with to say, here's how we, here's how we define our uh, JavaScript in terms of the Java that we all know and love. And from these, 
simple templates, we can start saying, okay, let's look for those templates automatically in our JavaScript and try to generate something useful that we can, uh, we can try to understand it in some form. So our ideal requirements for what this might look like, um, at least for me, I'd like to start writing in Java, ideally. I would not like to be writing JavaScript to understand the JavaScript. Um, I'd like it to be Gwit capable, because what would be sillier than having a tool that turns Java into JavaScript written, Java compiled into JavaScript. And I'd like to be fast enough to run in the browser. I haven't totally succeeded on this last point, uh, at least not for very large applications. But uh, it does work pretty well. Um, takes less than a minute to compile most applications I've been given permission to run. And then, again, going back to the beginning a little bit, some non-goals here. I'm not out to ruin GWT, believe it or not. Uh, I am not looking for class metadata. I am not looking for packages and class names. I'm assuming that in some of the uh, projects we're going to try and figure out, we've expressly turned off class metadata. I'm not looking for stack trace emulation. This is a handy feature which gives you very clear explanation of what's going on in each file, what's going on in each stack trace, down to the file in your project and the line number it happened on. This also has the uh, added side effect of doubling the size of your project when it's compiled. So I'm not assuming a lot of people are turning this on, uh, although you might be surprised. And I'm not planning on consuming source maps or symbol maps. Source maps, of course, being the mechanism that we use to debug in the browser or in uh, IntelliJ or Eclipse and map from super dev mode JavaScript back to our original Java again. Uh, symbol maps uh, being something that's used for some stack trace deobfuscation, for example, figuring out what the symbol meant when it was run uh, and what it maps back to in Java. And usually these are not shared. Usually these are not publicly available. Okay, so the first bit I went after, because I was familiar with it and I knew it was able to work uh, with GWT, was able to be compiled to GWT, was Java CC. This is a compiler compiler. I can define a language. Okay. Uh, I can define a grammar <coughs> in, a, in a consistent, recognized format, and I can compile it to Java. And depending on what kind of uh, language specification I wrote, I can usually compile it uh, into GWT Java. It's not always very fast, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And there are a ton of existing grammars already available. Uh, there's a whole lot of toy languages out there, like trying to build a calculator very simply, uh, HTML, things like that. Um, and I sort of expected that I would be just walking all over JavaScript grammars when I started this off, and found that that was not really the case. And actually, at the end of the day, I only ever found one implementation that came anywhere near close to actually covering all the things that we need JavaScript to do. And this ended up coming from the Dojo project. Uh, anybody use Dojo in any other JavaScript? I was a big fan of it when I used it a number of years ago before I first learned about GWT. Um, but uh, I didn't find that it moved terribly quickly. Um, and then, but when they did move quickly, they ended up adding some pretty cool things like Comet. Um, so it was kind of fun at the time. I found this ECMAScript.jjt, which is basically a description of the JavaScript grammar uh, in a format that could be machine readable and we could generate nice Java out of it. And then they've also got this handy thing called tree pattern. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And it came along with some, what I chose to interpret as example optimizations and static analysis over JavaScript. Because originally, the Dojo team uh, built this tool to look at their uncompiled JavaScript and try to compile it, either identifying errors or saying, here is a better way to shrink this down. Here are some structures we can get rid of that are handy to write but slow to run. And let's try to simplify those down a little bit. I have reached out to them a little bit about some of the changes I made. They don't seem to be interested in some of the feedback here. Uh, mostly it looks like they've decided that they would, write all, they would rather write all their tools in JavaScript than moving between different languages, which I suppose is okay too. And the reason I had to reach out to them is that I found it was an almost working ECMAScript, that JJT. They were missing a few things. They didn't have the debugger statement, which, I mean, to be fair, wasn't used uh, in, in a lot of apps until a few years ago. Uh, had some major UTF-8 issues, uh, a lot of strings that had any kind of UTF-8 character in them. It would just stop and not understand what they were talking about. Turned out just to be a flag that had to be flipped in their uh, preamble, in their uh, configuration settings. Uh, regular expression literals didn't work too well. There were a couple of problems there. Uh, mostly, if you put two slashes too close to each other, it said, oh, that's a comment, I know what that is, and ignore the rest of the line. Which, uh, in GWT, where you've got the entire function on one line, means you end up ignoring a lot of things and it no longer parses correctly. 
So that was probably the biggest, hardest thing to replace, uh, having to go through and learn how to build the regular expression grammar in Java CC so that way it could fit in with the rest of the grammar we'd already, we'd already uh, had to begin with so far. And then we also had a bit of a performance problem, and I'm gonna take a quick rabbit trail here and talk about some specific, one more specific pattern we can see in some JavaScript and see if anybody recognizes this and could possibly guess why this is a problem. So first of all, any idea what this code is doing? We're calling a method that's calling a method that's calling a method that's calling a method. It's a builder pattern of some kind. So if we look at this the other way around, it's start of the beginning, or sorry, start on the inside, new C, it's a constructor, and that is the staticified first argument for B, which is the first argument for B, which is the first argument for B. So you could also read this as new C dot B dot B dot B dot B dot A, a at the end. And what this maps to in Java is something like this, a string builder, we're appending A, we're appending A, we're appending A, and eventually, uh, the outermost method there is to string. Let's take the whole thing, turn it into a string, and do something with it. And it turns out a line like this, not with six or eight items, but with 20, would take longer to parse than the entire rest of the file combined, even for a multi-megabyte JavaScript application. Which turned out to be a problem, because a few people use string builders in their applications, or just concatenate strings and end up generating these things. So ended up trying to spend a little time and figure, okay, what's going on here? What actually does this grammar mean? Um, so this is our quick foray into exactly what is Java CC? Why do we need to care at all about it? Um, and this is just one of the little things about JavaScript that make us really love the language. An expression statement is an expression followed by a semicolon. It's, that's legal. You can just say one semicolon, whatever that expression happens to be. But then when you dig in further, an expression is actually an assignment expression, or it's an expression followed by a comma followed by an assignment expression. And then assignment expression in turn is either a conditional expression or it's a left hand assignment like equals, and then another assignment expression. Okay, so conditional then is possibly a logical or expression. A logical or expression is an and expression and so on and so on. Uh, we work our way all the way down until we get to post fix expression and then left-hand side expression again, which we saw much earlier, which can then also be a call expression. What's going on here? Why are we working our way from one type of expression to another type of expression? And what does it mean that we started up here with this first one? So we're establishing operator precedence. We want the comma to be the least important thing. If you see a comma somewhere, wait the longest to figure out what that means so we can build our tree of all the various symbols correctly. We want uh, or to be less important than and, and so on all the way down again. And the way that they end up writing that very first rule is look ahead of left-hand side expression and then assignment. So in other words, look for whatever is on the left side equals whatever is on the right side. And if we end up seeing some valid expression on the left side equals, then stop. We know we've got something equal something else, and we'll go ahead and parse it that way. That's what the second line here is. And then the third line is, but if you didn't find that, if for some reason you failed to find a valid left-hand side expression followed by equals, then we'll just treat it as a conditional expression and work our way down that way. And conditional expression in turn, again, assignment, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, let me back up just a little bit here. So this line here, actually, is, was the performance problem in a very brief nutshell. Can anybody see why? And I wouldn't blame you at all for not seeing why. I stared at this for several days before I finally figured out what was going on here. The expression ends up being parsed not just multiple times, but a stupidly large number of multiple times. There's no way to tell for this long expression here, and imagine instead of A, B, 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 we've got 18 or 20 of these. And for the very first outermost A, we want to say, okay, are you a left-hand side expression? Ah, I see you're an A. We'll parse all the way down to call expression. I see you have an open parenthesis. Okay, let's start on one of your arguments. Oh, B, I see you're, you might be a left-hand side expression. We still haven't finished the first part of the look ahead. So we'll do B, and we'll work our way all the way down, and then we'll do the next B all the way down, until we finally get to new C. And then we say, oh, uh, you don't have an assignment expression. Throw an exception, work our way up the stack a little bit, say, okay, well, we'll interpret you as a conditional expression, and all the way down. But we're still doing a look ahead for the innermost B, 
And then we see, oh, but I don't see a, an equal sign. Okay, back up. Let's backtrack again. So now we think that B is a uh, conditional expression. Let's reparse uh, the innermost, the new C. And we reparse that as, oh, are, are you a left-hand side expression? Oh, no, you're not. We don't remember what we did last time. There's no way to keep track of that. So we end up doing everything many, many times to the tune of uh, something twice or three times as long as this might take five minutes to run. Um, which clearly didn't work very well. So I ended up cheating. I ended up saying, instead of this large bit of grammar here, I'm going to say, well, let's start with a conditional expression on the one side, and then we may or may not have an equal sign, and then the rest of the assignment expression. So this is not JavaScript anymore. I've, I've broken JavaScript. I've allowed code that isn't legal. So how can I get away with this? Has anybody had the experience where GWT has ever compiled code that isn't valid, JavaScript, with the exception of people who work on the compiler? Probably not. So we already can assume we've got good working JavaScript. We wouldn't be trying to take it apart if it failed in the parse in the first step when we load it into our browser. So I'm assuming we've already got good code, and we'll go ahead and parse that working code. So we're not actually parsing JavaScript anymore. It's a slight variation of JavaScript so that we can uh, actually do something with it. OK, so in a very brief nutshell, that's the part I'm taking away from Dojo's JS Linker project. And now we're using that tool to try and actually figure out what's going on in this code. And I've got sort of a series of steps that ended up working pretty well to say, OK, let's go through all the code. Let's make a pass every time around, not terribly unlike the compiler, except we don't need to loop over and over again, and see what we can find. So first, we collect those global methods. And one more time, those global methods are constructors, class initializers, and we've got two different kinds of static methods we'll be looking for, plain old static methods and staticified instance methods. And then we build a global call graph. I haven't actually gotten around to using this just yet. I was in the process of trying to add something uh, earlier today so we could actually see a nice little call graph of all the things that are happening, or to be able to go in and find each of the calls to a class initializer and mark it as, hey, this is a class initializer. You don't need to click on it to find out what it does. I can tell you up front. And then we need to say, OK, now that we found, um, sorry, let's back up just a second. Yeah. Now that we found all the possible global methods, some of them are constructors. So let's identify which ones are constructors. And the easiest way is to start by looking for anyone who anywhere in the application, in the compiled code, started by calling new. If you called new on something, we found a constructor. And you might call it with uh, no parentheses, or you might call it with parentheses. We have to look for both variants. And then we need to say, OK, any constructor which calls another constructor. So just like we can't call superclass methods very easily uh, with plain JavaScript, we have to have another syntax we can use in here. And what we end up using is the name of the constructor we're calling, dot call, and then we'll pass in the object we're trying to continue constructing up the chain. In Java, you have to always have your this or your super call to be the first line of a constructor. So generally, uh, with a little tiny asterisk next to that, we can anticipate that this is going to be the first line in a constructor. Um, and then while we're at it, we can look for exception constructors. We can find most of them pretty simply with the thing we referred to either er, earlier, throw, new, something. And as long as we see that throw, new, and then some identifier, we can be pretty sure that we found a construction, sorry, an a exception type being constructed. So class initializers, again, we talked about this earlier. And these have got the funny property that you don't directly call them, but they have to be called in order for your code to be valid. And they end up looking perhaps something like this. The first one is a class that happens to have a class initializer. Um, because it's a static field, we can't just create it up front because we have to wait until our class has first been referenced to set it up. So in JavaScript, this ends up looking like this lower part of the slide here. Um, we end up saying, in our class initializers, the first time we reference this, we'll run this method, and let's go ahead and assign static stuff to this giant heap of things, which is how we initialize arrays in, in uh, GWT. But the first line we had here was the name of the method we just started with equals empty method. And that ends up being a pretty handy pattern to look for. We're trying to find methods with a name that the first thing they do is assign themselves to empty method. And what this means is whenever you call this class initializer for the first time, it will remove itself from existence so it can't be called again because we only want these to run once. 
So it makes sense when we look at it, especially from a JavaScript perspective, but it becomes a very easy pattern for us to look for and actually find things. Um, okay, so for each constructor we've got, because we've already found all of these things, we can find a reference to the constructor that didn't call it, and we can be pretty sure that this is the create class method, whatever that ends up looking like. And we know this is of the pattern, so here's the class ID, here's the super class ID, castable type map, and then all the various constructors. And then that builds a prototype, and we'll go ahead and assign some method to each one of those different pieces. And we know that those then are the polymorphic methods. And now we've got them by name, the name that they're actually going to be called, and we can actually walk down the list of types and say, okay, this overrides this, so they're probably related in some way, and they might even call each other. We can do some lookup later on to find out if that's the case. Then we take all these various classes we found, and we start wiring them together. Because we did have a super class ID, we can say, look for another class with an ID and see if we can actually connect them together, see if that actually makes sense. And we do this both for the classes and then also for the methods. This method has a super method. It overrides this. It might call it also. And then we get into the territory of, okay, well, what else could we conceivably do? We could find likely staticified methods, and we looked at this pattern earlier. It's a function which is uh, an instance method, and all it does is call a static method. We can be fairly certain that this is going to be the staticified version of the same method. Uh, we can't be 100% certain about this because it's very difficult to tell the difference between a staticified method and some other code that just happened to be inlined all its way up into there. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the system has to start suggesting to us at this point that that's what's going on. We could also find non-static inner classes. Remember I said little tiny asterisk? This is a case where you end up calling a superclass not on the first line. In Java, you always must make it the first line, but it turns out Java can do some other setup before you go ahead and call that, and the main case for that is non-static inner classes, or as we think of them, as event handlers. If you create an event handler that has a reference to some outside object, this is how it ends up getting a reference to that and how it keeps the reference to that later on. And then we've got our instance of checks. We know that Java is gonna have, or could have code like this, where we throw some exception and it gets, catched, or it gets caught, uh, depending on exactly what's going on here. And this is another one that we can actually improve on a little bit, because that generates code like this. We actually end up getting both catches, um, or rather just one catch, and then we need to do an instance of. We know we're in Java, we know there's a catch, and we see some if else, if else, if else, if else, that ends in an if with a rethrow. We can pretty reliably say that this method here is gonna be instance of, and then we can go ahead and look everywhere else in the application and say, aha, that's an instance of. Interestingly, we skip casts here. If you have if something, we just go ahead and use it as whatever type it was. But in any other code you write, if you say if instance of and then directly cast, even though clearly you've just passed the instance of, it will still go ahead and do the cast anyway. Um, and this is what it looks like when you closureify that. You still end up with basically the same code. Throw an exception, and then we have to catch it and check to see which type it ended up being. Um, and then finally, one other one that could be fun, uh, this array creation, because it is pretty deep and we can eventually see what's going on here. This is about the only place arrays show up in compiled GWT code, aside from inline Disney or something like that. So I've got a demo of this working. It's not perfect, but it does demonstrate the job pretty well. Um, does anybody want to see this running on a live application somewhere? A few hands raised, all right. Is anybody volunteering their own application for me to do this to? Uh, something running GWT, preferably. Well, I have a couple examples, very briefly, um, if no one's willing to volunteer. We could try GWT project. I haven't actually tried that one yet. The last time I got an example from the audience, it ended up being some Baden code, and uh, it ended up not, uh, not working. It found a bug. So, oops, we weren't supposed to get to that yet, were we? All right, so. Are you going to let me go ahead and take that apart? No. I'm trying not to get in trouble up here, actually. <laughs> okay, that one broke. Uh, that's true, but I'd like also not to ruffle any feathers if we can help it. Uh, if you're saying your lawyers would be perfectly okay with me going ahead and doing that, that's okay. 
I'm going to try not to get in trouble. Okay, so this is a simple, very small app that's been run through Clojure. Um, it takes a little while to paste such a giant chunk of JavaScript into Chrome. It doesn't really like it. And while this is actually not that big, it does take a little while to go through and parse this stuff here. If you put three or four megabytes into here, you can expect it to take upwards of a minute to go through. Um, I have my theories as to why this is the case, but I'd love someone else to take a look at why this is so much slower than JVM. It's a matter of seconds, uh, if even a second there. Um, there we go. And we have the class hierarchy here. And for each class, we can see the constructors, and we can see what those constructors are made of, what's actually going on in there, and then all the various methods they end up having. So this one does some static method first and then calls something else, and we can go to that method and see, okay, what's going on in here. And ideally, we'll have enough of a little more editor here so we can start labeling them. When we recognize what something is, give it a label, so when we see it somewhere else, we can begin to recognize that label and see what's going on. And at this point, this is really just a very simple front end put on a ton of code, a ton of trial and error to say, okay, exactly how do we take these various things apart. It's not very pretty just yet. It's just a matter of saying, okay, I've got all this raw data wrapped up in model objects. How do we give it to the user? And believe it or not, I'm actually not much of a UI developer, so it takes a little work for me to uh, build one of these. Uh, I'm certainly open to suggestions. But again, with the uh, trying to keep myself out of getting out of, in too much trouble, uh, right now the only way this project is available is online, uh, colinallworth.com slash A, as it says on the slide. And um, the reason I've got it that way is that if you, if you had the source, you could potentially do something a little scarier with it, potentially. I don't think it's likely at this point, uh, especially since what I found so far, and especially since developers do know they need to not let clients do things. Um, but if you can use the app to take itself apart and understand what it's doing, then as far as I'm concerned, you've got free reign to do everything because uh, you've managed to actually understand the ins and outs of this very compiled, obfuscated code. So, questions, yeah.